Ernest Rutherford estimated the size of the nucleus by using the conservation of energy. He assumed a head-on collision between an alpha particle and a gold nucleus, remember the gold foil experiment, and that all of the alpha particle's kinetic energy would transform into electric potential energy. The alpha particle would approach the nucleus and as it's getting closer to the nucleus, the nucleus is repelling it because the nucleus has a positive charge as does the alpha particle. At a certain point, and this is what he assumed the radius of the nucleus was, the alpha particle would stop momentarily as the two forces balanced, the repulsive force from the nucleus between the nucleus and the alpha particle, and the initial kinetic energy of the alpha particle which was shot at the gold nucleus. So at that point, you would have the kinetic energy equal to zero and the, the electric potential energy would be a maximum and then the alpha particle would rebound away. So Rutherford calculated that the radius of the gold nucleus would be 3.2 times 10 to the minus 14th meters. Further experiments by many many other researchers came up with this equation. The radius of a nucleus with an atomic mass of A is R0 times a raised to the one-third power where r0 is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15th meters. So nuclei have radii in the range of 10 to the minus 15th meters. So physicists are always looking to name things after other physicists. So when you deal with nuclei there's a term called the femtometer which was named in honor of Enrico Fermi. It's also called the Fermi and it's equal to 10 to the minus 15th meters. And Enrico Fermi is very famous for con constructing the first self-sustaining critical nuclear reaction and he did it in Chicago. Now just to give you an idea on the size of the nuclei before we compare them here, the term here it's dependent on the atomic mass to the one-third power. All nuclei are pretty much the same because if you have an object with an atomic mass of 8 8 to the one-third gives 2, so you have a factor of 2 times r0 to come up with its radius. If you have an object with an atomic mass of 216, well, the cube root of 216 is 6, so it's only 3 times larger than a very tiny element. So nuclei tend to be in the same area of femtometers. Now, atoms have radii on the order of 10 to the minus 10th meters five orders of magnitude larger. So you can see how tiny the nucleus really is. However, as small as a nucleus is, and how large the individual protons and neutrons are, the cool thing, again, is the charge on a proton is exactly the same as an electron. And yet the proton is 1,836 times more massive than an electron, yet the charge is the same. Electrons were described by both the Bohr model and the Schrodinger equation as being in well-defined energy levels. When the electrons move between levels, they either absorbed or emitted a photon, depending on whether they move to a higher or lower energy level. These photons can be in the infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, or X-ray areas of the electromagnetic spectrum. The structure depended mostly on the attractive Coulomb force between the nucleus and the electrons and a slight repulsive force between the electrons. The nucleus also has energy levels, but they're much more complex than the electrons. The reason is you have very strong repulsive, in this case, electromagnetic forces, the Coulomb force, between the protons that are packed within a very small volume. The force acts over an infinite distance, but decreases in magnitude as they get further apart. But the protons never really get too far apart from each other. They're compacted into that femtometer range. Contrasting with that, you have the strong nuclear force, which is giving you an attractive force, not only between the protons and the neutrons, but between protons and protons, and neutrons and neutrons. Now this force only acts over a distance of 10 to the minus 15th meters, the size of the nucleus, and actually it increases in strength to a point. So as the two protons get a little further away from each other, the force gets stronger. The strong nuclear force gets stronger. They get attracted more closely, 
But if they get too far apart, if, for example, if they get greater than this 10 to the minus 15th meters, there'll be no force. So it's this interplay of the attractive strong nuclear force and the repulsive electromagnetic force that gives rise to the nuclear energy levels. Summarizing, we have the strong nuclear force, which will oppose the repulsive Coulomb electromagnetic force, and will keep the nucleus together. The analysis of these competing forces creates a more complex energy level scheme. However, just like the electron energy levels, the nucleons can move between these energy levels. Nucleons meaning the protons and the neutrons. And when this occurs, very, very high energy photons in the form of gamma rays are emitted or absorbed. These, this is the most energetic form of electromagnetic radiation. So when electrons change levels, you can get visible light, you can get infrared, you can get x-rays. But x-rays are the most powerful rays that will come from electron transitions. Gamma rays will occur with transitions within a nucleus. One more force in the nucleus, the weak nuclear force. So that's the third fundamental force. We have strong nuclear, electromagnetic, now the weak nuclear force. And that's responsible for the radioactive decay that converts neutrons to protons. And again, that's when you get into the whole notion of quarks, which we're not going to cover here. And the last fundamental force of the four is gravitational, and it is far too small to even be measured.